you for, for coming. And um, we're uh, looking forward to the presentation today. Mary, Mary will do um, an introduction in a second. So I'm uh, Vicki Callan, the president of the St. John Naturalist Club. And um, we welcome all the members and the members of the public who are uh, here for the presentation today. I have a, just a small uh, short update on our upcoming events. Um, on April the 22nd in the evening, we have a members only amphibian walk available. So if you wanna check out the website or social media, you'll get the details on that. On the 23rd, we're doing a beginner birding workshop. These have been really popular. We've, we come with uh, binoculars for those who don't have them and um, let people um, learn how to do uh, birding in a, in a friendly environment. On April the 30th, we have a warbler ID workshop. On May the 13th, we're doing a daytime amphibian walk. Uh, the registrations aren't open for that yet, but will be soon. And then on the 20th of May, we have our next um, monthly meeting, uh, the a webinar with Ariel DeMerchant, a wildlife photographer. And again, that will um, open for registration soon. And most of you will know that we're hosting the Festival of Nature this year in St. John in June. So we're all really looking forward to that. Um, members of Nature New Brunswick can register now. The general public can start on April the 17th. Registration will be open. And uh, the last admin item is that we are um, in the process of recruiting for the next year to start in June. Uh, we're looking for a president a uh, treasurer and a chair of the program committee. So if anybody's interested in that, please uh, get in touch with us and we'll uh, we'll give you more information. All right, so now I'll turn it over to Mary Solos, please. Hey, thank you, Vicki. Um, and it is my pleasure this morning to introduce our guest speaker, Jim Landry. And so Jim has uh, 50 years of experience in the landscape horticultural profession. He began his career at Peacock Greenhouses in the 1970s and went on to manage Brunswick Nurseries in Quispam Sis for almost 30 years. During that time, he served as a volunteer with Landscape New Brunswick BEI, and that is where he is now employed as the executive director. Jim received his Ontario Diploma in Horticulture as well as a Landscape Manager Certification, and he's a certified journey person in his trade. Jim also ha has been the Landscape Correspondent for the local Information Morning Show on CBC for a number of years. So I'm really pleased to introduce our speaker and welcome Jim. And so Jim, now I'll turn the camera and the microphone over to you. Awesome. Well, thank you for that introduction. So can everybody hear me? I can hear you. Okay. I, sh I should have said, can one person hear me? <laughs> said one person can, everybody can. Can we see the screen? Yes. Awesome. That's the big fear. Okay. So um, I'll take you on a little journey and, and I'll, I'll break it down into a few components. The first being uh, my family and my my family's involvement. But first, I want to mention that I do currently work for Landscape New Brunswick. Landscape horticulture is a red seal trade, uh, has been for 12 years. Uh, we've had a school, we operated our own school for 12 years, and now the course is taking place at NBCC. So if you have anybody in your family that is looking for a career path or to change a career path, this is the best one. Landscape horticulture, it, it's such a broad spectrum trade to work in. Uh, I've like in my introduction mentioned that I've worked for over 50 years in this profession. So I don't know any of the other ones, but I do know that I do know this one very well. And um, it's, it's been very satisfying. And we're at a point in our planet's history where we need landscape horticulturalists more than ever. So not only can it be satisfying and rewarding, but it can be, uh, a, a, you can develop a really strong feeling of achievement that you're you're helping to solve the problems that the planet has now. Most of them are, are need nature-based solutions, and we're the nature-based solution people. Whether you're a landscape architect, designer, uh, contractor, maintenance person, grower, we initially started as a growers association. So when our prime minister wants us to plant two billion trees, then someone needs to be growing those trees, and you can't do that overnight. I'll just stop for a second. Is is my volume okay? We still. 
Sounds good, Jim. It works. Okay. Unfortunately, I have this transitions thing going with my slide show, which slowed things down a little bit. So this is my family. Um, this is my grand, my grandmother is in this shot along with her parents and her two brothers and her sister. The one we're focusing on today is the younger, taller gentleman on, on my right. Um, and that's my great uncle John. And he joined up um, to fight overseas during the First World War, along with his best friend down, down the road. I grew up, it, my, my entire time that I spent at my grandmother's house, which was a lot, I spent all my summers there, there was a little bit of a farm. It had been a working farm, but as they got older, the chickens went away and the cows went away. So by the time I got there, it was, it was more of a, just a country, an old country home where I spent my summers and Christmas breaks. And there were all these artifacts from my great uncle John kicking around. Uh, one of which was a wooden cross that came from, from Vimy. Uh, he was killed. Uh, well, he was wounded the first day of the battle, but he died a couple of days later in a field hospital. And they marked the grave sites with wooden crosses at the time. And then years later, I don't think a lot of years later, but a few years later, they were removed and replaced with those permanent headstones that we see today. Um, and the families back home had the opportunity to, uh, well, not purchase them, but they did have to pay for the shipping. And a lot of the families were poor at the time. Well, probably still now, but my family in particular was poor. They didn't own a farm. They worked on someone else's farm. So I don't know how they developed the resources to, to ship this wooden cross back home. A lot of the families uh, requested that the, uh, the little metal tag that was on it sent be sent back home and that fit nicely into an envelope and you know it was easy whereas the wooden cross I, I I bet would have been a little more difficult a little more expensive anyway my my family my grandparents and great-grandparents decided at one point that they would like to have that wooden cross and all my years growing up looking I seen it I didn't ask any questions about it there were other things around too there were letters that he had written to his parents and to my grandmother Unfortunately, I didn't pay enough attention to that. Uh, in fact, I didn't pay any attention other than the recognition that it, what it was. Didn't know any story behind it. And then everybody that knew the story passed on. So I, I guess if there's a message in that is, well, you have the opportunity to talk to people in your, in your background who, who maybe help to formulate your life, do it before they, uh, they lose that ability one way or the other. This is, this is, uh, this is St. John's uh, tombstone or headstone. This is his parents. They're buried in uh, Sussex. And it was funny. I knew that there was a stone in Sussex in the graveyard. I may have seen it when I was a kid. Um, and I decided one day I was going to go see if I could find it and take a picture of it because I was starting out on this journey to, to kind of follow my, my great uncle's footsteps. Uh, I parked my car, big cemetery, and I I walked for about 15 seconds. I walked directly to it. And I thought that's that that was odd. Um, but then a whole bunch of other odd things kind of came into place during this whole journey I went through. And I I, I label them all now as just serendipitous. These these things were intended to happen. Um, so we don't we don't need to talk about the, the battle itself. Um, maybe a little bit. I mean, it. If people have visited Vimy Ridge, they they know the location and they know that it's not it's not necessarily a ridge as much as it is just a little hill outside of a small town, four or five small towns that surround it, and a big city or fairly large city close by called Arras. And I got to spend some time in Arras. What I told a friend that I had my great uncle's wooden cross, um, and my friend was a um, He's a histor historian, and he's written he's written quite a few books, and and he focuses on the military because he's from the military too. And when I told him I had my great uncle's wooden cross, his response was, "No, you don't." I said, "I'm pretty sure I do. I think it's out in my garage." Uh, so it went from my grandparents' place, which was Uncle John's sister, uh, to my mother's place, and then on to me. I went out to the garage and brought it in. And his remark was, this needs to go to the Canadian War Museum. So that tells the story here, why I'm carrying it 
down the red cross, they're down the red carpet. I'm presenting it to uh, uh, General Vance, and he turned it over to the Canadian War Museum. So I, I was very, not just proud, but I, I, I felt very fortunate that I had the opportunity to do this. None of none of John's family ever visited his grave because uh, he's buried in 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 France, about six kilometers from Vimy Ridge. Uh, the reason for that is not that they didn't want to. It's just no no one had the the abilities to do that. You know, you're poor, um, all kinds of reasons why they couldn't make the trip. And so I was the first in my family that was fortunate enough to be able to do this. So I jumped on it. Took me a while to figure out where his gravesite was, even though things are well documented now, especially with the First World War, you can go through the archives and find kind of historically what happened to anybody that uh, that fought during that that war. Um, unfortunately, they made a mistake on where my great uncle was buried. They had the road numbers marked wrong. Uh, I went on Google Earth, and, and this is what I found. Uh, if you look at the upper left, that little uh, rectangle is the cemetery where he's buried. And the the bottom part of the picture shows the potato field which he was buried. And that that could be that could be Upham, New Brunswick or or Jeffrey's Corner, you know, that's where my family's from. That could easily be the, the same place. So a little difficult to get to. I when I travel, I tend not to rent cars. Um, I, I you know, I use public transportation or a bicycle. Uh, in this case, I walked the 12, well, it was about 12 kilometers uh, to get there in the pouring rain. I did an interview with CBC while I was there. That was, I thought that was really cool to be able to do that, but to set in this field uh, and be able to talk to people back home about my experience kind of in real time. And this is where, the, this is his uh, headstone. So again, this, this is a few kilometers away from the actual uh, ridge itself. And this is the town. Uh, this, this is the city nearby. This is Arras. Uh, the Canadians call it the Battle for Vimy Ridge, but but most of the Europeans and the British call it the Battle of Arras because that's the big city that's there. Um, it's funny when if you get an opportunity to visit some of these towns in, in Belgium and Holland and France and you're out in a town square and you think, oh, this is this is great. I mean, these buildings are hundreds of years old and and it's it, you see the culture in the buildings until someone points out well no the buildings themselves are actually only maybe 50 or 60 years old um they've been destroyed several times um they whenever they rebuild they try to rebuild to maintain the uh, kind of the same atmosphere and the same architecture but the backs of the buildings are all relatively new but that was kind of interesting um I mean, this is what it, this is what that town looked like after the battle and the battles, the, the battles in that part of the country lasted for months and months. It's not like they took place, uh, you know, it wasn't an overnight bombing. It was a it was a yearly bombing from both sides. So this is where my life kind of intersected with another person's life who I never met. Um, Leslie Miller fought at Vimy and. He survived the battle. Uh, he survived the war. After the battle, he sent some acorns to his farm in Scarborough, Ontario. He loved trees. And they knew he loved trees because when he, he kept a journal in his pocket and, and when he wrote, he, he didn't write about the French women or the French food or the French uh, countryside. He wrote mostly about trees. So he collected some acorns and sent them back to his farm in Scarborough. Uh, they, they later named his farm the Vimy Oak Farm. And that's where these trees have been growing ever since. There's only a few of them left. The property's been sold, but the, a couple of the trees are still there. Um, this is an interesting story. Um, and it's a great when I when I visit schools, it's not necessarily for kids, but it, the way the way that it's laid out, it's very easy to understand. And it's, you know, the artwork is nice and intriguing. So we I if I'm doing a Vimy oak planting at a school, I always try to make sure that they have that in their library and maybe take take a read of it first. Otherwise, they, um, you know, I, I I can explain it to them a lot easier if they've already had some kind of notion of what the story is about. Uh, this is the oak farm in Ontario as it was back then, like a hundred years ago. 
And this is a neighbor of Leslie Miller. I mentioned that Leslie survived the battle and survived the war and went home. And this was a neighbor. This was a little boy that lived next door who used to come over with his first initially with his parents, but after a while by himself. Uh, he was mentored by Leslie and and uh, he developed a real keen interest in in trees, particularly these Vimy oak trees. So he was the one that decided that um, after he visited Vimy Ridge, he realized there were no oak trees there. And he decided at the time that wouldn't it be great if we could repatriate these trees or or the acorns of these trees or cutting from these trees uh, back to uh, back to Vimy Ridge. Uh, his name is Monty McDonald. Uh, he's, he's still around. Um, I, I met him for the first time last summer because they were closing out the Vimy Oak Foundation's work, uh, closing the books. And uh, I hadn't seen him before that. I'd seen, I talked to him a lot on the phone. I made an offer once I heard that he was doing this. So here's what they did. They took cuttings off these big hundred year old oak trees at the Vimy Oak Farm in Scarborough. They grafted them onto rootstock. They did about 200 of them with the idea they would ship them to France to be planted at this new park they were trying to develop right beside the monument. So I don't know how many, how many people that's listening in have gone and visited the monument. Um, if you haven't visited in the last four or five years, it's, it's, the monument's the same, will always be the same, but the, the environment around it has changed significantly in that they developed this, what they call the Centennial Park. So this is the kind of the architect's drawing of what the park was intended to look like. And now that it's been planted for several years, um, this is an artist artist rendering of what it would look like maybe in 25 years from now. Uh, the walkways are there, the trees are planted, but they're small, the benches are there. And they planted the trees. So they there's a little bit of a backstory here, though, too. The trees that they grafted um, onto rootstock and were going to ship to France, the French government said, no, great idea, but we're not going to allow you to ship trees. It's difficult to ship trees from one continent to another. You're not allowed to transport soil from one continent to another. And there's certain species of trees you can't, and oak is one of them. So they said, thanks, but no thanks. We will, however, accept acorns. So if you want to ship some acorns over, we will germinate them here in a nursery near Paris and we'll bring them to the ridge and we'll plant them. Well, what happened was the trees, oak trees, I don't know how well you know oak trees, but they can be stubborn. Um, and I think if they hear someone saying they want acorns, they stop producing them. And that's exactly what happened. They went several years without producing any acorns. So that kind of put the project back. They wanted to have this all done by the 100th anniversary. Uh, so it actually delayed things by two or three years. So then the question was, well, what do we do with these 200 trees that we've grafted already and are growing in a nursery in Ontario? And then they thought, well, we, we do need to raise money for this project. So why don't we sell them to legions and schools, mostly legions? And they did the advertising through Legion magazines. And when I and that's when I heard about it. I heard that they were going to plant these or they were going to sell these trees to legions. And I thought, well, how, how can I be part of that? And my, my apologies to couriers, but I didn't want to see Canada Post or Purolator handling these trees from Scarborough, Ontario into New Brunswick, considering it would cost quite a bit of money. Imagine how much it would cost to ship a tree that size and how do you protect it from getting broken, dried out? So I thought, well, I can help out by having those trees brought in all at once. So I guessed how many trees might be planted here. Uh, I asked a friend in Sussex if he would, he was a nurseryman. So Brookdale Tree Land Nursery near Sussex in Millstream said, we have trucks rolling through Southern Ontario all the time. We'll, we'll give you space for a couple of pallets. I think we shipped in 75. They went to, to this nursery in Sussex where they looked after them. And I went, my idea was that I would tell the legions when they wanted to buy them, the shipping now was free because I didn't cost anything to bring them in. Uh, they could come to the nursery and pick them up. That was my intention, but it didn't work out that way. Uh, the first call I got was from, from a, sorry, here's another picture of the park. So if you see, that's the monument on the bottom left that you're all familiar with. 
and the parking lot there and the new Centennial Park is that big circle. So this was a few years ago before the planting was done. Gives you a really good impression of the, you know, the, the pock marks in the field too, from where the, all the bombs uh, blew the place apart. I have yet to see this, by the way. I seen it uh, just before the trees were planted. This was the first planting that we did. Uh, it was in May, although it could have been could have been February. It snowed later on in this in this picture. Um, so I got a call from the Legion in Cardigan, and they wanted to plant a tree. And I said, "Well, I'm coming to PEI. I'll bring it with me." And I did. Um, and we organized uh, an afternoon to plant it. And it was wonderful. I had a, I, it was a, it was a really moving experience for me. The whole town came out. Uh, we had tea later. We talked to some of the, the families of veterans, um, and and we planted this tree. And I thought at that time I'm going to be as involved as I can with as many of these tree plantings as possible, uh, just because it was it was so rewarding. I'm going to jump ahead and here. This next picture is this same tree, and it was taken just prior to uh, to Fiona. And I that clump of branches on the left hand side is what I pruned off the tree, uh, and I'm glad I did because I think it, there were trees after the storm that had blown down all around it. But that one, uh, I think I gave enough, opened up enough space so that the wind blew through blew through it instead of blowing it over. And I collected these acorns off it. I actually collected a lot more than this. By the time I finished, I think I had about 300 acorns. And when I think back to those 100-year-old oak trees in Scarborough that refused to produce acorns when they were 100 years old for a couple of years, you know, this, this guy was just taken up the slack. And oddly enough, I got a request last year from the Vimeo Foundation. They asked me if I had any acorns. Because they stopped, they stopped production of these trees. It was a limited, kind of a limited edition thing. And I said, yeah, do I ever? So I shipped some back to Scarborough, Ontario, which kind of made the whole thing full circle for me. Um, and this is, I threw this picture in just because it's kind of the, the aftermath of Fiona. I do a bicycle ride for the Alzheimer's Society every year. Uh, it's a solo ride. And I part of it is usually... Part of it is always Prince Edward Island on the Confederation Trail. So this is along St. Peter's Bay. And I wanted, at, at, I use this slide to remind me about the value of trees and why we need them and why we need to, we need to rethink things when there's storms. Like this is, in some cases, there's a blank slate on areas of the island now where something's got to be done. Trees need to be replaced. What varieties, what, what'll do best? What, what can we do to help the trees that are still there? So that was kind of a side note. Next few slides are just plantings that we did. Uh, this was one of our students from our from our uh, Red Seal program, and this is at uh, Pine Park in Cambridge Narrows. Beautiful spring day, nice little tree. Uh, this is in Red Rock, and we had we had a lot of the Legion people out. Um, this tree I planted in Norton. And shortly after this was, I think this was the second tree that I planted. And the idea was it was raining really hard. It was cold. And I told these people, you go inside the Legion, get the tea going and I'll get the, I'll dig the hole. I'll have it all ready. And the veterans can come out and we can throw the, the last ceremonial shovel full of soil over the plant. And they wouldn't have any part of that idea. So they came, this gentleman here was in his 90s. Uh, his father had fought in the, in the First World War. He was gassed in the First World War. When, so he helped dig the hole and plant the tree. And when we went back inside, he, to, he, was telling, he was telling the story of his father. And it was so emotional for him that he couldn't get through it. And I thought, this was, this was 100 years ago. I mean, it was, a, it was almost 100 years in his life and how it could be so still attached to to his soul it was amazing and that this was the second planting we did and this is what convinced me that i needed to plant help plant virtually all of the trees 
I loved delivering them. I loved digging the hole. Sometimes it was huge groups of people. Sometimes it was just a select few. Um, my wife and I planted a tree at a legion by ourselves. And we made sure that it was recognized for what it was. Some of the trees, they put plaques up. This tree died. In fact, a lot of them did. Either were vandalized, although I don't like to use that word. They, 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 were, they were subject to maybe even innocent pulling out of the ground or branches broke off but that and that's the story when I tell stories to kids about trees one of the things I always tell them is about 50 percent of the trees that we plant survive and the other 50 don't so there's a lesson there we need to be more careful I don't know what happened to it when I seen it it was cut off at the ground and but I don't think somebody cut it off at the ground. I think it broke off, could have been snow load, and then they realized it wasn't going to grow into a tree, so they cut it off at the ground. Tree sprouted back up again, so it's still there. Uh, I will go back and visit it and do some pruning, but what we did, we planted another one from an acorn from a tree just like this. Maybe this tree, but I don't think so. Um, we planted it closer to the legion. So that just gave us an opportunity again to tell the story. So it's it's not a devastating thing when a, when a tree dies, especially if you're planting it for a reason. The reason's still there, the story's still there. I planted one at a school on the west side. And when I was done, I asked the kids, these were elementary school, I said, so if what do we do if this tree dies? And I waited until someone said, and a, and a little girl in the front row said, we plant another one. I said, that's it. That's the lesson. We plant this is we plant these trees, these these memorial trees. We plant them for a reason. Uh, and, and one of the big reasons is hope for the future. So what's the lesson? Do we give up hope or do we just do it again? Um, so how, how, how are we doing with time? Can you still hear me? Yeah, you're doing fine, Jim. Has everybody left? <laughs> <laughs> We're still here. Uh, you're okay. at 1030 now, so you're good. Okay. Um, I'll show you one more picture of a planting, but then I'm going to take, no, I'm going to show you this picture. So this is BTN Atlantic. I had mentioned that I had a tree, a friend at a tree nursery in Sussex who said he'd help me out by bringing the trees. So he brought these trees in, looked after them at the nursery, and I picked them up four or five at a time and took them to where they were going to be planted. And like I said, in most cases, I help with the planting. Um, so this is shortly after they arrived when I went up to pick some up. So this is a girl that works at that nursery. And, sorry. When I picked them up, I said, she said, I watered the trees for you. And I said, great, thanks. I really appreciate that. I appreciate you looking after them. Um, she said, my, my great uncle was killed at Vimy Ridge. And she said, we don't, we don't even know where he's buried. And we've never visited his gravesite. And I said, well, what's his name? And she told me, let's go back a little bit. When I visited Vimy Ridge, uh, and visited my uncle's gravesite. I took a picture of my uncle's gravestone, and I took a picture of his of his friend. Remember that picture at the start that showed him uh, seated beside his friend. I visited his gravesite. It was a different one, and I took pictures of the headstones. I took another picture of a headstone in a little cemetery called Petite Vimy, and there was a there was a headstone. When when you visit the the uh, the cemeteries there. They're they're all they're they're all uh, maintained by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, and they're all very similar. They all have a little brass door that you open it up, and it's got the list of all the all the people that are buried there, and also a little bit of their history, where they came from. Um, there was a 17 year old from Sussex in the front row, and his name was Harry Carr. That was her uncle. And I thought, how strange is that, that I would have taken that one picture, that, that third picture of his headstone. And when she said it was Harry Carr, in my mind, I, I knew that I had a picture on my phone with me of his headstone, but I didn't want to say it because I thought, well, maybe it's, maybe it's a different car, maybe. It... 
So I looked it up and, and sure enough, I said it had had to be him. So I showed it to her and it just it was it was it was so touching. Like she just broke down. And then a few days later. Uh, well, there's the, there's a picture from the book and near the bottom, second from the bottom, Private Harry Alvin, car, fifth mounted rifles, uh, died the 2nd of June 1917. He was 17 years old, son of Harry and Mary Elizabeth of Waterford, New Brunswick. So not only did I take a picture of the headstone, but I took a picture of uh, of, of that. Uh, if you look up two or three, there was a private Ivan Bunker from um, from Russell Gornish. So I've st I have not contacted his family. I've tried to. I know some people in Russell Gornish, and I but but I haven't made a contact. And maybe maybe I never will. But I thought that that would be another interesting conversation to have. We planted one of those Vimy oaks in Sussex behind the Legion, and this is the family of uh, there are other veterans in the family of this descendant of of Harry Carr, and that tree in Sussex is doing really well. And I learned a lesson from this gentleman in the wheelchair after the planting. He said, uh, we, we talked about the tree. We talked about the value of trees. We talked about Fimi Ridge. And when it was all said and done, he said, I want to go over and touch the tree. So what I learned from that is that tactile part of this whole process of planting trees, doing them for a reason, you know, talking about hope for the future. And now I make sure whenever I plant, and I don't plant the trees anymore, the kids plant the trees when I do it at schools, or the veterans plant them when I when I do it at legions. Uh, I, I make sure that everybody has a chance to, to have that intimate tactile um, opportunity with the trees. Uh, this was a tree planted at, uh, at Sullivan's Pond. Uh, with a good friend of mine, and that tree died. And I was trying to find a picture of the tree that we just replanted uh, with this one for this one. And I did it. There was a little school right across from the from Sullivan's Pond, and I invited them to come over. And it was brilliant. The kids had a great time. Uh, we had three veterans from the Legion come and help with the planting. My wife was there. It was it was wonderful. That's that's the slide that was going to have the picture of the kids planting the tree, but it couldn't find it. Uh, this is another short story. Um, I had the opportunity, I wanted to plant one of the trees at Vimy Ridge, and I made that request to the Vimy Oak Foundation, and they said, sure, we're going to do it in November. Well, I, I wanted to go bi bicycling in Northern Europe, and I thought, I'm not going to bicycle in November. And they weren't even sure it was going to happen in November with all of the delays. So I said, can I have a tree? And I'll find a place to plant it. So they said, yes, we'll, we'll make sure that one of the trees that's been grown from an acorn for four years in a nursery in Paris is, is taken to you and you find a place to plant it. It won't be at the ridge because that's going to be done by a, a group of landscape contractors along with some kids. So I just went on a search. And uh, now I, I had been over there before. So I, I knew the area a bit. My first my first thought was to plant it at a elementary school at the town of Vimy. That didn't work out. They didn't have any green space. So I thought, well, I'll plant one at the town hall and the kids can plant it in the little town of Vimy. That didn't work out. They, they kind of stopped communicating with me. The other little towns around, and there's four of them around the ridge, I contacted each of them. I couldn't make it work. And I was trying up until the point that I left, or up to the point where I left to go to France to plant the tree. And when I got there, so this is the town of Arras. There was no, I had no tree at this point. They were not going to ship it, but they had no place to ship it to. Uh, on Thursday, and I was leaving on Monday, so the weekend was coming up. I had no tree and I had no place to plant it. I had 50 Canadian flags and 50 Canadian pins because I was still hoping that I'd find a school that would help me plant this tree, hopefully plant it at the school. I met this gentleman who's bent over with the shovel. Uh, he's part of the Vimy Oak Foundation. He's their guy on the ground in, in France. Uh, I went to his house. Uh, we spent a couple of days together. He asked me, he said, so where's the tree? I said, it's in Paris. He said, so what's going to happen? I said, they're going to ship the tree to you and I'm going to go home and you're going to plant it and send me some pictures. Um, 
we walked into the town square. He said, let's go have a coffee. We went into a coffee shop. He walked in and he turned and he looked at me. He said, there's the mayor of Ross right there. So he spent two minutes talking to him after the conversation they had. We had a location, which was this park, and we had a tree. It hadn't arrived yet, but it was being, it was on route. So everything was set, except for I didn't have any, I was disappointed there was no school kids. Uh, I was going to plant this tree with with my buddy here, and that was going to be the end of it. Although the city, the they sent a counselor. The mayor couldn't make it, but they sent a counselor. Um, I'm walking through the parking lot with the tree in my hand, and there's a bus from England parked there. And I thought, this is this is not typical of my behavior, but I stepped on the bus and I said, what are you guys doing? And they said, we came to visit this, this war memorial site, but they won't let us in because it's too late in the day and they want too much money anyway. I said, why don't you come with me and plant a tree? So this is the aftermath of all of that. I had 50 kids. Uh, I don't speak French, unfortunately. So if it hadn't been a bus from from, from France, I, I would have needed a translator. It wouldn't have been the same thing. This was a, the the oldest Catholic school in the UK. They visit Vimy Ridge every year with a different group of people, and they were they were thrilled. And they sent me their um, I have it here on my wall. They they sent me their little bullet, news bulletin that they put out every week, and it tells the story of my great uncle John. So the jet the ball gentleman in the back, uh, he was making notes as I was talking about. John, I, I make this personal. I mean, I, I don't treat John as if he's, you know, had a significant role in the battle. He had he had an average role in the battle, even so much so that he was killed because that was sort of the average. If you were there, you were likely to be killed. Typical farm boy from from New Brunswick. Uh, everything about him was was typical. So I tell the story about this tree through my great uncle's process, and he was writing it down. And he relayed it back. He, and the first thing he said was, uh, sometimes the universe conspires for you. Monday afternoon, I find myself in the city of Arras, uh, surrounded by 39 kids. Um, we'd stopped for a break outside the Wellington Quarry. And from nowhere, a man came running up to me with an ink, carrying an English oak sapling around eight feet high. Excuse me, he said in a Canadian accent. I don't mean to bother you. Uh, but I was wondering if you would like to learn the story of this tree. So I thought, wow, that's I, I couldn't have I couldn't have built that scenario. You know, the fact that it all just kind of fell into place was just a little more serendipity for me. All right. So check my clock here. I've got just a few more. And this is we do have a, a question. OK, um, Maureen's asking, uh, we have uh, one of the trees in Grand Bay Westfield. Did you help with it? Yes, I planted that with the mayor of Grand Bay initially. I think it's been moved twice. Um, I know where it is now. In fact, I, I trimmed it uh, last fall. That's the beauty of having these trees all over New Brunswick and PEI. I, I do bicycle a lot. Um, and whenever I'm passing by one of the trees, I always stop, see how it's doing, pull the weeds out, prune it up a little bit. I usually carry a little bit of... Uh, uh, compost in my car so I'll and if there's acorns on it I harvest the acorns so yes I am familiar with that that tree so that was a second planting the original one didn't make the um, the move because it moved from one location to another so now my mission and I've got the the, the Vimy Oak Foundation has allowed me to do this They've closed shop. They don't have any more trees. Uh, they, they've closed the books. And I said, do you mind if I harvest the acorns off the trees? And I do make sure I take them off the tree, not off the ground, because I want to I want to be able to, to tell the kids that this is off this tree. This is this is the next generation of the Vimy Oaks. Uh, the genetics is the same. They tell the, the same story. So. I collect them. I have a nursery in Sussex that germinates them. I germinated a bunch myself this year. Um, and I take them to schools and we plant them. And it gives us the opportunity to talk. I mean, it, it, it's it's a long, broad story that these trees can tell us. You know, it's 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 Canadian history, it's family history. Every kid that every group of kids that I plant with has someone in their family that can relate to if if not Vimy Ridge, then the First World War, or if not, then the Second World War, or people in the uh, that are in the military today. 
So it's just it's a, it's it's a talking point. It gets me in the schools. I don't I don't charge for any of this. This is something that I do because I love it. This is one, and this isn't a Vimy Oak. Obviously, we did a project last year uh, for the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, and we planted a hundred white spruce um, at various locations. And this was a planting we did. This is in Rosse. So different tree, different story, but it's still a story and it's still a tree and there's still kids involved. And it, we talk history and, and we encourage them to, to talk and, and connect with their local legion or seniors home, you know, what, whatever it takes to make things a little more intergenerational. My main point, I tell the kids, there's three types of kids. There's kids that like to get their hands dirty, and then there's kids that don't. And then there's more kids, the biggest group of kids don't know if they like to get their hands dirty or not. So we give them the opportunity. So just a few more slides on this. Uh, we do work with, uh, with K to 12. Um, this is a little design thing we do. It's a little sandbox and the kids get to design what might be a, a residential property, however they want to deal with it. They put the horse up on the roof if they want, and they quite often do. And we talk about how we need to do a better job of taking care of trees. This is a ginkgo tree. I planted five of them at a school on the west side. Uh, I love doing it. Kids love doing it. Trees like being there. The, the, the yard maintenance guys come along with the mowers and whipper snippers and do damage. So that's a lesson. This is one of our members. Uh, he's a he's an arborist and he's talking to the kids about trees and they don't often get a chance to hear about trees from somebody that's 25 feet up the tree or get them to watch, get to watch them scale it. I asked these this group of kids how many wanted to be an arborist like Luke and they all said they would. And I'm hoping that one of them will continue on in that career path and become an arborist. So when we have storms blow through, they'll be able to uh, help with the cleanup. This is some of the oak trees that I'm growing in my room right beside me here. Don't do this at home. Uh, what I've done is they germinate. Uh, acorns germinate almost immediately, especially English oaks. And... Uh, the first thing they do is shoot a root down into the soil. They'll do that about two months after you take them off the tree. And then you take them outside and put them in the yard and let them grow a top next spring. But I missed that opportunity. And now I missed that window. So now they're in my window. They think they're tropical plants. I have to slowly introduce them back into nature one evening. I, I'll take them out during the day now. I'll leave them out at night if it's not going to be freezing because I don't, I don't want to lose them. So these are destined for schools. These are just different. Let's end with that. So that's a ginkgo leaf. That was going to be a question I was going to ask, but I guess I didn't. Thank you very much, Jim. This is that was really an awesome presentation. And there are a couple of uh, questions uh, in the chat. Uh, is there a list of locations of Vimy tree locations that that we can access somewhere? Yeah, this this speaks to me more than anything else. Uh, I started, and the original seventy five that I brought in, of course, I had a spreadsheet, and you know, I ticked them off as we planted them. Uh, now that I've planted maybe two hundred and fifty, I've kind of lost track. And how many were replanted? Um, I do have that original list. I can make that available. And the trees that I de haven't had the opportunity to visit or revisit which are just only a select few. I, I, I'd like to know how they're doing. Um, the ones on PEI, they're almost all planted along the trail. So whenever I go through, and I try to go through late in the fall when I can harvest the acorns too. So sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll make two trips. Um, the trees that I've gotten the most acorns off of were that one that I showed in Cardigan. Uh, there's one right across from the Cenotaph in Fredericton. And there's one in Victoria Park in Moncton. And that's where I've got the most acorns. Mm -hmm. But they, they are strewed all over the place. They're English oaks. They don't grow in, in the, I don't think they'll grow way up north, or at least not yet, which is disturbing to think that, you know, the climate's going to warm enough, enough that we can grow English oaks in Camelton. But there are, there are some in, um, 
I think the furthest I've gone is Bathurst. Mm -hmm. But other than, other than that, there's 200 of them planted. Hopefully, if 50% of them are growing, there's 100 Bimmy Oaks. And there'll be, there'll be 25 or 30 more every year going forward. Wow. That's great. Um, uh, another question is, is the tree at the 8th Hussars Field in Sussex a Vimy Ridge tree? Um, this is from Timothy Bannister. Uh, he took about a dozen acorns about four years ago and planted them on a small property in Cody's in honor of uh, his grandfather, H.S. Gamblin of the 8th Hussars. Do you know if that uh, is one of the vimeage trees? Well, I think they are. And that's odd because whenever I hear about another vimeage, Vimy Ridge tree that I didn't plant, I wonder how that got kind of around me. I mean, I'm glad that it happened, but I think they planted four at the eight Cesars there and I wasn't part of it. I know that they, they haven't done well. They may still be alive. Um, and I, 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 I approached them last year, but I don't think I ever got in contact with someone because I've got, I'd like to replant the ones that didn't do well. There is one behind the Legion in Sussex. That's one that we planted and I showed, I showed a picture of it. It had one acorn on it this year, but yeah, I, I, I'm going to stop in at, at the eight Cesars here behind the, the cannon and, and ask them if I can kind of help out to get a tree established there. Cause I don't, like I said, initially, I don't want to give up hope on these trees. We just replant them. Right. Um, uh, Maureen says that she thought the Grand Bay tree didn't look very strong and she's wondering if you think it's okay and do you think it'll survive? I think it will. I, want, I wonder when she looked at it last because it was later last fall that I stopped in and did quite a bit of pruning on it. It was it left on their own growing in a field and if anything happens to that terminal bud then they think that they're a shrub and they'll grow into a giant shrub and that's not the intention it's nice to have because it's planted by the flagpoles there it, it needs to grow up straight develop a, a trunk and then a, a crown starting at like seven or eight feet so you slowly work your way up as the tree grows so that the, the lowest branch is maybe seven or eight feet off the ground so that's my my intention and uh, not going to say i'm going to look after that tree for perpetuity but i am going to look after every time i drive by i'm going to swing in and touch it up a little bit. So unless something happened to it this winter, last fall, it looked pretty good after I gave it a haircut. Oh, great. Um, and I'll just finish with one last comment. Uh, Vicki's wondering if you could share a slide that would help us identify the Vimy trees by their leaves or, or bark or other characteristics. Yeah. So it's, it's uh, I don't have a picture, it's an English oak. So I also use the fact that it's an English oak to talk about the benefits of native trees because it's not one. Same as the ginkgo. I love planting ginkgo trees and I talk about why it's important to plant native trees using the fact that it isn't one to start that conversation. It's okay to plant some trees that aren't native. So it's very similar to the, to the white oak. It's, it's, a, it's in the same category as the white oaks. So that's the upper middle picture. The other trees that are there and white oak is native to Canada but the English oak isn't and the other ones are are native Canada. Do they compete with the native trees? No they're not they're not competitive so they're exotic but they're not invasive exotic which is what we really have to be careful of and most people that may be on this call but most people I know are guilty of planting invasive exotic trees one in particular which is the Norway maple so that's either the one with the red leaves uh the the one with the green leaves with the white border and so many of the other green leaf trees the best way to spot them is not by the shape of the leaf but by the fact that the leaves in by July are covered with black tar spots okay. and they're very aggressive they're taking over forests along the eastern seaboard great Yes, unfortunately, we don't even have to plant them to have our properties uh, covered with them. That's right. I mean, yeah. I've, I'm in East St. John here, and everybody that's got a lilac hedge is soon going to have a Norway maple hedge. It's going to get out competed by the, by the Norway seeds that just fall in it. Well, we could keep this going forever, but um, before you leave, I really want to thank you. And uh, it was really an emotional presentation. So you've touched so many lives through 
through this project and you know just from from your memories however vague they were as a little boy and keeping that that cross in your mind and then just just exploding with it and and uh, sharing it with everybody and I love that so many generations uh, are being influenced by it and uh, it, and you're doing great work. I, I'm really impressed. Well, thank you. I always say I get more out of it than I put into it. It's very satisfying and gratifying. So I appreciate okay. that. And, and that really came through in your presentation. Thanks so much. So I'll, uh, with that, I'm going to thank Jim and I'm going to thank everyone else from joining us uh, for joining us and remind you uh, to take a look at the um, at the website for the St. John Naturalist Club for upcoming events. And our uh, next speaker will be Ariel DeMerchant uh, in May on the 20th, I believe. And uh, so with that, I'll say, have a great weekend. Bye everyone. Thanks, Jim. Cheers. <laughs>